coconut oil and it should be melted. So if yours isn't melted, just pop it in the microwave for like 15 or 30 seconds until it's melted. Um, we're just gonna throw that in. And then, um, this is kind of a fun part. I really like to experiment with different extracts. And so I think that that's how you can kind of make the same recipe, but add different flavor profiles to it. So um, today I just have vanilla and almond extract, which go really nicely and kind of bring out the almond flour flavor, um, just the natural flavor of the almonds. But if you don't really like that, then don't, you don't have to use it. Like you can just leave it out and do all vanilla extract or um, I like to experiment. I love Fiore de Cecilia extract. It is just has the most lovely like citrusy nutty flavor. You could also do that um, but just be careful with those different extracts. Uh, they're really powerful. So you just want to do about an eighth of a teaspoon or a quarter of a teaspoon um, is a really good option because otherwise it can end up tasting like soap and you don't want that. So I always say start off um, with just really small amounts and then you can gradually add more. Um, so I'm going to do vanilla and almond extract today and I'm going to do a half a teaspoon of the vanilla and a quarter of a teaspoon of the almonds. Um, And then we just put that together. And then we're gonna whisk it all together or you can also kind of stir it. And it's just gonna start to get like really thick and dough-like. So I'm gonna kind of switch, I think, from my whisk to a spatula. And I like to just use a rubber spatula, it's perfect for this. Um, So it'll start to come together. So now we kind of have a dough and we can add um, our almonds to this mixture. So here are just unsalted, dry, toasted, sliced almonds that I get from Trader Joe's that I love. Um, but if you have just regular whole almonds, that's great too. Um, you can just slice them up uh, with a knife on your cutting board just so that they're thinner. You don't want like a big chunk of almond when you bite into your biscotti. You just want a nice, smooth, small bite. So we're going to do a half a cup of almonds. Also, Rex just said that the, mid, the stream started mid-recipe, so oh. perhaps you could recap what you've done so far. Okay, sorry guys, we're Maybe like multitasking. Adrian's telling me what's going on as I'm doing this. So um, we're also connected. For those of you who don't know, I'm partnering with Art of Motion today for the launch of their online adult ballet summer intensive. Um, which is really exciting. And so we're kicking it off with a brunch with me, the ballerina baker. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing here today. And I'm offering you guys this free little baking class with, um, we are making a bore biscotti, as I'm calling it. We're doing a little play on words and a frothy frappe chino. And everything is gluten-free, dairy-free, and grain-free, which is really great if you're either A, have allergies yourself, or if you're making these for other people um, that have allergies. It's just a really great, easy thing to whip up and serve to your guests or for you to eat in the morning with your cup of coffee or tea, um, or if you just need a little afternoon pick-me-up, um, these are a really great option to make. So I love making these biscotti, um, and I'm really excited to share that with all of you guys today. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Jordan Fry, and I am a core artist with Ballet West, um, as well as my husband and I own 
a luxury cake company here in Salt Lake City, Utah called The Ballerina Baker, um, where I get to make really fun and extravagant wedding cakes and cakes for um, just customers across the nation. Um, I've had so much fun traveling and also staying here and doing um, just luxury events. So if you find yourself in need of a cake artist for any of your events or um, if you're just wanting uh, decorative cookies or macarons or something for your event, um, I would love to be a part of that. So go ahead and reach out to me. Um, and yeah, we can, I would love to work with you and create something special for your day. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, and after we throw these in the oven, I'm going to do a little question and answer session, uh, so that you guys can ask me questions, um, about anything, whether that's dance related or baking related, or maybe doesn't relate to either of those. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. So, um, I'm just going to recap kind of what we've done since, um, I heard that the YouTube channel started halfway into the recipe. So what we did is we combined all of our dry ingredients, um, which was the flour, the sugar, the baking powder, and the salt. And we put them in a mixing bowl and we mixed them together. And then we added in our wet ingredients, which was the egg and the coconut oil and our um, extracts. And then we combined that together to get a dough. So you kind of have a dough that looks like this. Um, and then we are adding in our sliced almonds and now we're gonna add in our dried fruit. Um, and this is another area where you can kind of pick your flavorings. So today I have chosen to use uh, dried apricots and uh, dried hibiscus flowers, which are kind of a fun tangy element to these, but you can use whatever you want, whatever you have on hand, whether that's dried blueberries or raisins or cherries, figs, dates, really anything um, will taste amazing in these. So I'm going to grab mine and throw them in. And then uh, we're just going to stir it together. So it's a little bit of a thick dough, so you kind of want to almost like knead and fold with your spatula to get them to stir together. So now you should have a nice dough. Don't want to tip the bowl too much to show you guys. Or it's going to come falling out. Um, so now that we've created our dough, we are going to put it on um, a piece of parchment paper. I'm just going to kind of clear my workstation. So I'm going to grab my piece of parchment paper and I'm going to put it on my counter and dump out the dough. Somebody asked, what does the oven need to be set to? Oh, yes. Great question. So somebody asked what the oven needs to be set to. So we are going to set our oven to 350 degrees. Um, and that can vary. Like, hopefully you know your oven. If you have a convection oven, it means that you set um, 25 degrees below that. So you're going to go at 325. Um or if your oven tends to be a little bit hotter, you know, adjust for your own oven. Um, you should do that too. Okay, so I essentially just put the dough out onto my parchment paper, and hopefully you can see that. Um, and I formed it into a little ball just with my hands. And now I'm going to take another piece of parchment paper and I'm going to place it on top of 
my um, little balled dough. And now I'm going to take my rolling pin and we're just going to roll it out into, you're aiming for it to be a rough rectangle shape that is about six inches by 12 inches. So we're just going to start rolling. And if your parchment paper happens to get a little crinkled or something in there, um, don't worry about it. You can just easily lift up the parchment paper and then kind of straighten it and smooth it out and put it back down. Um, and you want it to be, uh, you want the dough to be about a quarter of an inch thick. So just keep checking it. Uh, you want a good thickness on it. So I think mine is pretty good. So we're just going to remove the parchment paper and set that aside. And I like to kind of push my edges in of the dough so that they are a little bit cleaner when it bakes. Uh, but that's totally your preference. If you like a biscotti that's a little more rustic around the edge, then you certainly don't have to do that. Um... So I'm just kind of shaping it a little bit before I throw it in the oven. So I'm going to lift this up to kind of show you guys. So this is what the finished product should roughly look like. It's about a quarter or a half of an inch thick and 6 by 12 inches long as a rectangle. So we're going to grab our cookie sheet and we're going to throw that on the cookie sheet. And I just like to leave it on the same piece of parchment paper. And then we're going to stick this in the oven um, at 350 um, for about 25 minutes to a half an hour just until it is golden brown on the top and um, kind of, you don't want it to be like too hard or too golden, just like lightly browned. So we'll go ahead and put that in our oven and set your timer if you have one for 25 minutes and then we'll give it a check um, at that point. Um, so wash your hands too because they're probably really sticky at this point if you've been touching your dough. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wash my hands. Um, and then if you guys have any questions at all, um, yeah, I would love to answer your questions. So that will be what we're doing next. So you can think about any questions that you have. Oh. Rex asked a temperature question. Oh yeah, Rex asked a temperature question. Should there be a different temperature for lower elevation bakers? Oh, should there be a different temperature for lower elevation bakers? Um, you do not need to change the temperature for this depending on your elevation. Um, I would just adjust the temperature depending on um, your oven itself. Like my oven tends to be really hot. So I lower my temp by, this sounds crazy, but by 50 degrees for pretty much anything that I bake. Um, but I also have a convection bake on my oven, so things tend to like go faster. So I would say that that just kind of depends on your oven and kind of um, your knowledge of your oven. So get to know your oven would be a really good tip, I guess. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, Allison what? said, can I come eat your biscottis after? Oh, Allison. Not with social distancing. <laughs> Allison asked if she can come eat my biscottis. Maybe I'll bring you some, Allison. Um, <laughs> my mom asked, hi, mom. 
Um, what do you love most about baking and dancing and how are they the same? Great question, mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> So baking and dancing, uh, I actually feel like are very similar in a lot of ways. And um, that is because I think that it requires an element of uh, perfectionism for both. I think baking as opposed to cooking, uh, you have to be a little more exact. Like when we started out doing two cups of flour, like I wouldn't recommend just eyeballing that and dumping the flour into the bowl until you think it's about two cups. Um, it doesn't really work that way and you may not get the best result. So there's definitely an element to having it be a, a perfect measurement and perfectly level and all of those things um, that I think ballet demands of you or dance demands of you. Um, but then also I find that there's freedom within those boundaries. Like we talked about uh, different extracts and um, different dried fruits that you can add to change up the flavor of whatever it is that you're making. So um, I think that that is also a great way that you can bring creativity and freedom and put your own artistic flair and style on something uh, without, um, I guess, compromising the bounds um, of what, what it is that you're making. So I think that those are kind of, that's how I like to tie the ballet world and the baking world together is that um, you kind of have these boundaries, but then there's a lot of freedom and artistic created creativity within those boundaries. Um, yeah, so that's what I love about both. And baking is super therapeutic to me, so it's just something fun to do. Laura asks. Oh, Laura asked. Hi, Laura. Uh, would you recommend cake flour, bread flour, or all-purpose flour if you were to do a biscotti? Re like, okay, sorry, there were two parts to the question, and I can't find okay. the first one. First part, if you were to make the same recipe with regular flour, would it be the same proportions as almond flour? Oh, yes, good question, Laura. So, yes, I think, I haven't actually tried it, but usually for most of my other baking things, it is a... Uh, even proportion for almond flour to regular flour. So if you were to make these with um, all-purpose flour, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing the bread flour um, option just because that you start to mess with the protein levels in the flour, which gets very scientific. So I, I wouldn't go that route. I would definitely stick to all-purpose flour if you don't have almond flour on hand. Um, and I would do two cups of almond flour. And then if it's looking to, um, like you don't want it to be really liquidy. You want it to be like kind of thick, like a thick cookie dough. And if it doesn't look like that, then I would say add in more flour um, to that. So I would say add in like a half a cup of or start out with a quarter of a cup, sorry, of flour, and then gradually increase until you get the right texture that you're looking for. Hopefully that answers your question. Sarah asks, how do you find time for baking when you're a dancer? Oh, Sarah asks, how do I find time for baking when I'm a dancer? Great question. It can be challenging, um, especially when you're really tired and <laughs> or when when you're performing which we perform a lot um, I find it to be really hard so uh, but I also find it to be really therapeutic so I typically will bake on days off um, just to kind of release energy um, or I also if it's like nutcracker season and we're performing like 50 shows of nutcracker I will actually uh, bake something on a day off and then I'll put the dough in the freezer. Um, so like, let's say I'm making cookies. I'll just put them, make the cookie balls of dough and put them in the freezer. And then um, when I come home after a show and I really want that chocolate chip cookie, I can just throw it in the oven and you have your freshly baked cookie, but it doesn't take all that time. So helpful tip to help you survive nutcracker season. Nightly asks, oh. how was your day today? <laughs> Nightly, my niece, my cute niece Nightly, 
asked how my day was, how my day is today, and it's going great. Thanks, Knightley. Leslie asked, is this recipe posted on your blog? Oh. I'm a little late to the party. Also, do you have a good homemade dog treat? Oh. And say hello to Tater. Oh, Leslie. Leslie asked if this uh, recipe is going to be posted on my blog. And yes, we will post the recipe on my blog um, once we're done with this YouTube Instagram live. Um, and Allison should also be saving this video um, to her YouTube as well. So you can go back and watch the full video if you were late to join. Um, and then a good homemade dog treat recipe. I do have a good homemade dog treat recipe um, that I am hoping to do a little tea with Tater at some point this summer and invite all of Tater's girlfriends over for a little tea party. So get excited for that in the future. Somebody asks, I am a 13 year old dancer and I love baking. Do you have any tips? And how do you get started in baking but still be able to balance ballet? Oh, okay. So somebody asks, um, she says that she's a 13-year-old dancer and loves to bake and also loves to dance. So tips for baking as well as balancing baking and ballet. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So um, tips for getting started in baking. I would just say start. Like that's really what I did. I Bought, I loved Martha Stewart. I bought Martha Stewart magazine and I made her tiramisu cupcakes and they were the most amazing cupcakes I've ever made. And that just hooked me. So I would say start by, um, I feel like there's so many resources out there today between blogs and YouTube and cooking books and magazines. So um, yeah, just pick somebody that, um, that you really like, like even if that's, you know, whether that's Martha Stewart or um, going to a blog like Half Baked Harvest. Um, I love some of their stuff and they have easy beginner baking things. Um, that would be a great place to start or even like um, Food 52 or uh, America's Test Kitchen. Recipes are just people like that or companies like that that have really um, done a good job in perfecting their baking. Um, I would recommend starting there and they usually have really clear guidelines um, and you know pictures that help you along the way of what it should look like. Um, so and then you can kind of start to experiment you know like once you've made it a couple times maybe try adding in a little flair of your own. Um, and then as far as balancing baking and ballet um, I find baking to be super therapeutic, so it's really relaxing for me to come home and uh, bake. Um, but then also, I will say, like, it does become a challenge when you have your own baking business and, you know, you're doing a wedding cake. So I'll spend like 80 hours a week on one wedding cake, um, which is a lot of time. And so I will only do a wedding cake when I am not dancing. <laughs> because it requires so much of my time and energy. So I would also recommend that if you're doing a really big project um, or you wanna try something that takes more time, like maybe you wanna try croissants, uh, those are a little bit more demanding of your time than just a little batch of chocolate chip cookies. So I would recommend um, allocating that time well so that you don't have to run off to dance class in the middle. Shalom asks. Oh, hi, Shalom. Where do you find your favorite recipes? Oh, Shalom asks where I find my favorite recipes. Uh, oh, that's hard. I feel like I have a lot of different sources for recipes. Um, I really liked blog. Really love blogs. Um, I think they're great um, for just like helping and creativity. Uh, so some of my favorite blogs are Half Baked Harvest. Um, I love Danielle Walker uh, with Against All Grain. She does um, like grain-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, uh, just bakes as well as like cooking. Um, so she's great if you have allergies or um, restrictions in your eating. Um, I also love Sweet Laurel. She does a lot of um, grain-free, gluten-free baking as well. And... 
uh, they have a really cute bakery in California. So if you live in California, you should check that out. Um, yeah, those are a few Maggie Austin cakes. Um, she's one of my mentors and I love her for like cake decorating. Like if you want to get into sugar flower work, um, or if you just want to experiment and try, uh, some new things and you're decorating, she's a great person. Her book, um, is fantastic. Her cookbook. Um, so yeah, those are some people that I would recommend just off the top of my head. Good transition into Laura's next question, oh. which is how did you discover sugar flowers? Yours are unreal. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. So Laura asked how I discovered sugar flowers. Um, so my, yeah, my sugar flower discovery was because of Maggie Austin. Um, and Maggie was a dancer with the Joffrey. Um, and then she got injured and um, couldn't continue on in her dance career. Uh, so she turned to cakes and she has now become one of the world's best cake decorators. She does cakes for like Obama's Christmas party when he was in the White House and um, the royal family and Beyonce. Like it's just crazy her repertoire of people that she has created cakes for. Um, and she has really launched the like sugar flower, uh, luxury cake art uh, kind of product like that is kind of hers um, and so I've been fortunate enough to study under her a couple of times and she's just the sweetest girl uh, so full of knowledge and just really wants to give that away um, and so so I've learned from Maggie and kind of taken a lot of her techniques and then uh, played with it. I think that's the beautiful thing that Maggie teaches is you know she gives you what she's learned and then she invites you to um, add your own artistic um, flair and ability to it. So especially with a sugar flower, like I'm not going to replicate a perfect flower from my garden. Like that is something that nature created that I cannot possibly replicate, but I can certainly look at it and see uh, the way that the lines are going in the flower or, you know, try and replicate the shapes or the, um, like the fluffiness or just different aspects of the flower, I can try and recreate and sugar. Um, so I'm not going for an exact replica, but I'm going for my own artistic interpretation of that flower. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but yeah, and they're really fun to make. So if anybody has interest in learning that, um, I would love to do more videos or tutorials on that as well. John Hansen asks, oh. what are your favorite cookies? John Hansen asks, what are my favorite cookies? Um, hi, John. Um, gosh, that is a hard call. Well, this summer I have been experimenting with uh, homemade Girl Scout cookies, and I have to say that they are probably my best cookies that I have ever made. So I've done Samoas, Tagalongs, and Thin Mints. Um, and I already posted the Samoa recipe on my blog, so if you are interested in that, um, check that out. And we are working on um, the Tagalongs and the Thin Mints. Uh, but we, yeah, they are amazing. So I highly recommend those. What is your favorite thing to bake? Oh, what is my favorite thing to bake? Oh, uh, that's really hard. <laughs> um, I guess I love cakes because I think that they... Um, have the most artistic, um, I guess they, they allow me to be the most artistic. Like it's kind of like a blank canvas and I can do whatever I want to that. Uh, but if I'm just baking, not for like, um, appearance, I would say that I love just like a nice summery tart or maybe right now, I guess it's maybe seasonal. I feel like in the winter, you know, I'm craving like a ginger cookie or something, but right now I could go for a nice tart with some clotted cream and fruit. Not a question, just a comment from somebody oh. on YouTube named Professor A that says, I love your kitchen with the copper accents. Oh, thanks. Somebody commented on my copper accents. With yes. The, and they also said, with the caveat, said the victim of an ongoing kitchen remodel. Oh, said the victim of an ongoing kitchen remodel. Yes. 
I myself am getting ready to renovate our kitchen. Wish us luck. Somebody also asked, how do you experiment with recipes? Oh, somebody asked how you experiment with recipes. That is a great question. Um, so kind of like how we talked about uh, as we were making this, where I, like, I would say the easiest way to start experimenting with recipes would be with the flavors. So I wouldn't start by adjusting, like, the flour and the baking powder and salt and like all of those important ratios, uh, the fat ratio, because those are necessary uh, for the science of the baked good. But certainly start with experimenting with flavors. So that can be as easy as extracts, which I talked about. Um, extracts come in so many different flavors and uh, yeah, just different profiles like you can even find like root beer or <laughs> I don't know just like crazy stuff like that um which I haven't tried but if you do try that I would love to hear about it um but I usually have in my pantry um like almond vanilla coconut peppermint um orange blossom rose water I think that those are great things to add in unique flavors to your baked goods I love Fiore de Cecilia extract. It's a little more on the pricey side, but you're only using a tiny amount in anything that you make. And I seriously put that in everything that you bake because it will just add a really unique flavor to it where when somebody tries it, they'll be wondering, what is this? It's so good. It has such a unique flavor and it's that Fiore de Cecilia extract. Um, and it is made by... Um, uh, King Arthur flour and so you can either get it through them online or um, Sur La Table also carries it so if you have one of those near you or you could order it online I highly recommend that um, other ideas for flavor profiles switching it up I would say like in this recipe we altered the dried fruit like you can do whatever you want with the dried fruit um, or, or even almonds, like maybe you aren't a big almond fan, um, add in like toasted coconut or pistachios, um, really anything, um, that kind of has a similar texture, but I wouldn't necessarily start adjusting, uh, like I wouldn't change if you switch to a different nut, I would still do, um, a half a cup of that nut. I wouldn't start altering uh, the science of the recipe until you're more familiar with baking. Shalom asked, is it possible to use liquid espresso, and if so, how much, instead of the powder for the coffee yes. recipe? Yes. So, good question. We are getting to the coffee recipe. And Shalom asked if it's possible to use liquid espresso instead of powdered espresso. And the answer to that question is no. It's a weird, I, I don't even know how this works. The science behind it is super crazy. Um, and we'll start that really soon. Uh, but you need the powdered espresso to do it. And I don't know why. I think that there's something in the powdered espresso that whips it up like whipped cream um, scientifically. So Somebody asked, how do you decorate a cake? Oh, somebody asked how you decorate a cake. That is a very wide ranged question. Um, <laughs> uh, wow, okay, so you could do a lot of different things. You could do, um, I always start with the frosting. So the frosting could be different textured, it could be smooth, um, it could really be whatever you want. Which you have a YouTube um, tutorial. Yes, which on. I do have a YouTube tutorial on smooth frosting your cake. Uh, but it could also be rough textured, um, you could do fondant over it, and fondant adds like a lot of different variety to your cake decorating uh, because you can paint on fondant, you can um, do like lace appliques on fondant. Uh, there's so many different things that you can do with fondant as opposed to buttercream. Um, and then after that, it's kind of really whatever you want. So you could do uh, sugar flowers, real flowers, sprinkles, um, different like coloring, um, like metallics. I don't know. There's there's lots of crazy stuff that you can do with cake decorating um, that makes it really fun and exciting and that every cake can be different. And really, like I do believe that it can be a work of art. So 
Yes. John asks, okay. do you bake meats like a chicken oh. pot pie or a meat pastry? Yeah, so John asked if I bake meats like a chicken pot pie or a pastry, and I do. Um, I love chicken pot pies, um, and I love like meat pies, although I've never done like those traditional British handheld meat pies. Uh, that might be kind of fun that you see on like Great British Bake Off or something. Um, but yeah, I love a good puff pastry. Um, even quiches, I think, are great with like a good pie crust on the bottom. Um, yeah, these are all excellent questions. Thanks, guys. So now I'm thinking, let's go ahead and start making our frothy frappe chino. Uh, it's really easy. It's super fun. Maybe you've seen them. They're really trendy right now. I think it's called what is it called? Like a whipped coffee. It's like a whipped coffee, but it's like a delicata or it has some interesting name to it. But we decided to play off the ballet theme, and we are naming it a frappe chino. Which, if you don't know what a frappe is in ballet. <laughs> It's just a strike against the floor. I don't know if you can see that, but um, we can't. Okay, Adrian said you can't. <laughs> but <laughs> that's what we're we're doing a little play of words on that one. So we're gonna start by um, just taking a bowl and our um, instant espresso. So this one is like a um, Italian brand, I think. Um, but even if you have like Starbucks brand or anything like that, that will work. And we are going to use two tablespoons of that. So, and this recipe is really easy because it's, um, even. So we're going to do two tablespoons of the instant espresso, and then we're going to do two tablespoons of sugar and then two tablespoons of hot water. Um, so I'm going to grab our sugar. And then the hot water, it doesn't have to be like, you don't need to go boil water right now. Um, you can just do it from your tap. So just run your um, tap water till it gets really hot. I'm just going to turn that on really quick so it starts to get hot. Um, and then just take two tablespoons of water from that. Um, and then if you have a hand whisk, we're just going to whisk it together. Or you can also do it by hand. It will take a lot longer. Um, but it is possible <laughs> with just a regular whisk. Um, or if you have like one of those whisks that you put into... Uh, milk for your latte or cappuccino to make it frothy you can also use that which is what I'm going to be using I haven't tried it in a KitchenAid um, I think because it's such a small amount uh, the whisk in your KitchenAid may not reach it to whip it up like you need it to uh, which is why I think a hand whisk um, is probably a better option to go with on that. Alexa asks if she can use regular espresso. Okay. Um, so we got another question about the regular espresso, and I don't think you can. Um, I haven't tried it, uh, but I think that there is some, I mean, feel free to try it right now and see if it works. Um, but I think that there's something in this instant espresso that makes it whip up into like whipped cream um it's kind of magical when it happens so i go ahead and try it if you don't have instant espresso but i can't guarantee you what the results will be like so now that we have this together i'm going to go get my little whisk So this is what I have, um, just that you stick in your, you know, latte, and we're just going to start whisking it together. And it should start to lighten in color and then start to thicken up. So 
I don't know if you can see this. And I also might do a little bit of hand whisking, um, too, just because that, that little frother isn't the best sometimes. But you're looking for the con consistency of, like, whipped cream or... Um, like Cool Whip, if you've ever purchased that. It's a really great arm workout if you haven't done your workout for the day. Okay, let me see if I can show you guys. So... This is, it's starting to get really thick and like whipped cream like. And it's light in color. It almost looks like caramel. Um, whereas when you started, it was like a really dark coffee color. Yeah, so I think that that is about good. Um, it's a nice thick, and if you have a, like one of those electronic hand mixers, that it'll go really fast, but I do not. I just have my kitchen in, so that's why we're doing this by hand. So then once that is finished, and I am just going to check our biscotti, it's looking good. Just a couple more minutes on that one. Um, so now you're just going to take any non-dairy milk or dairy milk that you have works great. Um, but if you are dairy free, do the dairy free milk. So um, I like to use my ripple. Uh, protein milk and we're just gonna put it in a glass and you can put ice in it um, I think I'll put a few ice cubes in mine um, and then we're just gonna top it with our whipped coffee mixture So I put in about three ice cubes and then we're topping with our whipped coffee. So now you get this beautiful to the whipped coffees on top and then the milks on the bottom and then you just put in your straw and stir and sip and enjoy and it is delicious. And on that note, um, I think our biscotti is ready to come out. So it is nice and golden brown at this point on the top. And it's still a little soft to the touch, which is what we want because now it's going to cool and then we're going to cut it um, into the traditional little biscotti shapes and put them back in the oven. So you guys are going to put yours on your cooling rack and let it cool for about 30 minutes to an hour. Um, I already did one this morning for you guys. so. 
so that this doesn't take, so you aren't here with me for like three hours today. <laughs> so here's my cool biscotti. Um, and we are just gonna slice this. So I'll show you how I slice it. Um, not enough space, hence the kitchen renovation. So I'm going to take a uh, serrated knife and we're just going to slice um, lengthwise so that they look like um, biscottis. I'll show you. So there's like my slice number one. It's and that's obviously an end piece, but that's kind of what you're going for. Um, three quarters of an inch thick and sliced. So here's number two. Looks good, huh? So now we're gonna put it on our baking sheet with the cut side up. And we're gonna put it back in the oven for another um, 10 to 12 minutes just until the cut sides start to brown because right now they're kind of soft and doughy. And a traditional biscotti, you want it to be really crunchy. You want it when you bite into it to have that nice snap to it. So that is what we're going for so that you can dip it in your frothy frappuccino or your hot tea or coffee and um, have it kind of dissolve the hardness of the biscotti a little bit. So we're just going to keep cutting this. And you should get um, a pretty decent amount from your biscotti. And if they happen to like kind of break or crumble like mine just did, it's, I usually always get one that breaks in half. It's just the way it is. It's okay. He just bake it as two, and now you have two biscottis. I would like to know if the oh. people who tried making the coffee with espresso had any oh, luck. Oh, yeah. Adrian asks if he would like to know if anybody tried making the coffee with espresso, if you guys had any luck in doing that. Because that, um, uh, yes, I would also like to know that. So now we have them arranged, our sliced biscotti cut side up like so, and we're going to throw it back in the oven, like I said, for about 10 to 12 minutes until they start to brown. And then you're going to flip them over and brown the other side. And then your biscottis will be complete and delicious. And I love to eat them when they're warm straight out of the oven. Um, or you can put them in a uh, just airtight container and keep them for a week um, or even pop them in the freezer. and. Keep them for up to three months. And if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to answer those. Somebody else, somebody said that the espresso did not work. Oh, somebody said the espresso did not work. That's good to know. That is good to know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that there is something special in this espresso powder that for some reason it whips up like whipped cream really quickly. We have about two minutes left, so okay. Instagram will. Sign yes, off in Instagram minutes. will sign me off in two minutes. Um, 
but yeah, thank you guys so much for joining me today. It was so fun to bake with you. Um, go ahead and post your um, photos of your biscotti and your um, frothy frappuccinos um, and tag me and Art of Motion. Um, and if you are taking the Art of Motion Adult Summer Program, have so much fun. Uh, I hope that you guys learn a lot this week and um, just enjoy dancing in your homes and your kitchens. Um, and I hope that it brings you just um, life and hope in the midst of this season. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me, everyone. Have a great week. Bye. End stream. Well, it's still. Just give me that. I can just click it.